Hello, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion um, on risk adjusted return. So the discount rate that we use when we compute the value of the investment has to reflect the risk of the investment. So we explain that the discount rate represents the opportunity cost of money. So what should it encompass? At the minimum, if you are giving up your consumption today, meaning you are putting your money in an investment in instead of spending, you should get compensated for at least inflation because otherwise you end up losing in real terms. In addition to that, we have to take into account the risk of the investment and the different kinds of risk that we had talked about. First, there's the financial leverage risk. Cause, so if the, if the, if the firm uses, uh, borrows money, uses debt in its capital structure, that will, inc that will include financial risk. Um, the other is business risk. Business risks can be affected by operating leverage. And this is the degree of fixed cost versus variable cost. And then also the variability of sales. So a company that's in a cyclical industry will have higher variability of sales. Uh, a company that is in a cyclical industry that has a high operating leverage will have an even higher business risk. And so you will see, and the total risk of the investment is a combination of business risk and financial risk. As we said, the minimum that a, a, an investment, even if it has no risk, has to compensate for inflation. An investment that has no risk, we call that the risk-free rate. So the, if you are looking at a risk-free investment, the opportunity cost is the risk-free rate and the only opportunity cost is inflation. Uh, the concept of inflation is oftentimes um, introduced through the comparison of your real rate of return versus a nominal rate of return. The nominal rate of return takes into account the effects of inflation. In fact, the relationship is oftentimes um, called the Fisher relationship. So the real return or the real rate does not include inflation. The nominal rate includes rela uh, inflation. And the relationship is uh, such that the nominal rate is one plus the real rate times one plus the inflation rate minus one. If both the real rate and the inflation rate are relatively small, you can approximate that. So the nominal rate is approximately the sum of the real rate and the inflation rate. So we have talked about inflation and the relationship between nominal and real rate. Next, how are we going to account for different kind of risk in the discount rate? Before we do that, I want to first introduce the principle of diversification. Diversification is a uh, sophisticated way of saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So if you diversify, meaning if you spread your investment risk across a large number of different kinds of stocks, um, you can reduce the risk. Um, the, again, we use variability, um, which oftentimes is measured by standard deviation or variance. Um, the beauty of diversification is that you can reduce the risk without reducing return. And the reason we can do that is because if you invest in many different stocks, uh, some company may do really well one day, um, but another company may do less than, but le uh, less than expected or worse than expected. So the unexpected gain will likely offset the unexpected losses. However, we have to keep in mind that stock investment is risky. So no matter how much we diversify, there will be some risk that will remain. So the risk that cannot be diversified away is called the systematic risk. So for each stock, you can think of its risk, its total risk as uh, has two components, a systematic component and a diversifiable component. If you, have, if you are an individual investor and you purchase a 
a large number of stocks and put them into a well diversified portfolio, then you can eliminate, you can get rid of the diversifiable risk. However, so this can be eliminated, but you will always have the systematic risk remaining. This is an important concept to keep in mind. For the, for the, from the perspective of an investor, an investor may face just a systematic risk. However, from the company's perspective, um, you always have both risk. From the company's perspective, you have the a systematic risk and diversifiable risk. So you imagine you're the CEO of a firm. If something bad happened to your firm and your firm went out of business, that is, that's it. Your, your company is, is gone. But if you're an investor and you have a well diversified portfolio with thousands of stocks, one company going bankrupt uh, is not going to significantly affect your entire portfolio. So the, the risk of an individual stock is much higher than the risk of a well diversified portfolio. So if a risk of an individual stock, the total risk has two components. And for a well diversified portfolio, it only have a systematic component. A picture is worth a thousand words. So this is a um, this is this picture shows you the effects of diversification. So if you have only one stock in your portfolio, uh, your total risk, which is oftentimes measured by standard deviation, can be as high as 49%. But if you increase the number of stock in your portfolio to 10, it can drop by more than half. However, no matter how many stock you, you put in to your portfolio, the benefit of diversification is, um, is very significant in the first 10 to 20 stocks. But once you go past 30 stocks, then the incremental amount of risk that you can reduce through diversification goes down significantly. Um, in fact, um, for even large, large portfolio of thousands of stocks, the, the standard deviation seldom go below 20 or 19%. So this shows you, you can gain a lot by diversifying from one stock to 10 stock to 20 stock, but there is always risk remaining. These are non-diversifiable, which is another name for systematic risk. The benefit of diversification is a foundation of the capital asset pricing model, sometimes referred to as CAPM. There's a lot of assumptions behind the capital asset pricing model. Here are some of the important ones. The uh, CAPM assumes that markets are perfect and competitive. Perfect means that there are no frictions. Friction will include everything from transaction costs to tax. Uh, competitive market means that any single individual will have a very small impact on uh, the price. So um, the price is solely determined by supply and demand in the market. It also assumes that the mar uh, markets are efficient. Efficient market means that the current price of the market reflects all available information about the investment. Furthermore, investors are rational and risk averse. What that means is for the same level of return, investors will prefer lower risk. And for the same level of risk, investor will prefer a higher return. So that's rational and risk averse. So lower risk is better, higher risk is better. Finally, this is, a, this is a key assumption that leads us to the conclusion of the capital asset pricing model. Uh, homogeneous expectation among investors. What that means is if, if investors were given the same information, they'll process it the same way and they'll come to the same conclusion. Again, this is very important. So if you're given the same set, same set of facts, you will draw the same conclusion. So these are four, there are additional assumptions, but these are the four key assumptions. All these assumptions has been uh, 
uh, obviously they are not completely true. Um, some can be relaxed and the model will become more complex, but the basic um, the basic conclusions do not change. Uh, we can relax the perfect market assumption, uh, meaning introduce transaction costs, introduce tax. Uh, that does not fully um, affect the overall conclusion, just makes the model a little bit more complicated. A lot of work has been done in testing whether or not financial markets are efficient. And in general, uh, we conclude that the markets are semi-strong form efficient. What that means is that all publicly available information are incorporated into the stock price. Whether or not stock investors are rational, risk-averse, and have homogeneous expectation, that is an area of high uh, controversy, and um, and there are evidence showing that this may not be the case. However, the good news. Um, the good news is this may change the um, may may make the capital asset pricing model less than less than a good model, but it's still actually one of the most commonly used model because it's still better than the other models that we have available. Uh, you it's not uncommon for an analyst to use um, the capital asset pricing model as the base and incorporate their own variation to it. Uh, in this course, we're going to use the basic capital asset pricing model. Uh, once again, um, it is sufficient to demonstrate um, the key aspect of how we can incorporate risk into the discount rate. So let's assume that all these assumptions are correct or uh, valid. If they are valid, then the capital asset pricing model come to the following conclusion. Since all investors are rational and risk averse, they would definitely choose a diversified, a well-diversified portfolio. And since they have homogeneous expectation and they have the same set of information, then everybody will choose exactly the same well-diversified portfolio. And since they all agree on which diverse, well-diversified portfolio is the best one to have, that portfolio will become the market. An analogy will be Amazon. Let's say we all conclude that um, Amazon is the best place to buy everything. If that's the case, whenever I need to buy something, I will go to Amazon. And you want to buy something, you'll go to Amazon. What will happen is that every other store, every other shopping website will go out of business because no one will go there. And Amazon will become the market. So it's the same thing here. Uh, if everybody agree that the same well diversified portfolio is the best, then that portfolio will become the market. And, um, and the only risk that is left is the systematic risk. And since every investor will hold the same well diversified portfolio, the only relevant risk is the systematic risk. And therefore, the required return on the stock depends only on your systematic risk and not the total risk. Um, the formula is um, you can then relate the required return on a stock, so stock J, to the risk of the stock so beta j, and the return on the market. So let's define each of these terms. So e is expectation. So, so the expected return, so our e j is e here stands for equity. So we have a lot of e's here. So return on equity for stock for company j. Our f is the risk-free rate. And most of the time we use a treasury bill. U.S. Treasury as a proxy, and beta is the systematic risk of firm J, and we can obtain that through regression analysis, and we have done that in an earlier chapter, so you actually know how to do this already. And RM is the required return on the market portfolio. We oftentimes use the S&P 500 index as a proxy. Um, the difference between this last term here, this entire 
term, the difference between the expected return on the market and the risk-free rate is called the market risk premium. So the basic um, key elements of the capital asset pricing model, which makes it a great model to learn about how to incorporate risk, is the fact that this is a linear model. So we can start with the, so we all start with the risk-free rate. So if any of a stock have no risk, it should earn the risk-free rate, which compensate an investor for inflation. And then you'll get additional compensation for two things. One is the beta, which is the amount of risk. So how much risk does this particular stock carry? And then the second component is the market risk premium. The market pre risk premium is the market price of risk. So depending on the market price of risk and the amount of risk, the expected return will be higher or lower. Uh, a very useful um, reference point for beta is the number one. Uh, the risk of the, the systematic risk of the market as a whole is one. So it's standardized to the market. A stock that has a beta greater than one has a higher systematic risk than the market. A stock has a beta less than one, it has a less systematic risk than the market. So if you use the capital asset pricing model as a base, you can see that um, you only has one risk factor, which is the market risk. And the and if you have so to expand beyond capital asset pricing model, you can have additional risk factor. Um, but so but the basic idea is the same if you don't have any risk you should be compensated for inflation if you have risk then you will need to add additional risk premium to compensate for the risk that investors are taking now that you have a basic understanding of the relationship between risk and return let's take a look at the cost of different types of capital so cost here, the word cost refers to the opportunity cost. So this is actually the required return. The first type of capital we're going to look at is common equity. In fact, most analysts use the capital asset pricing model to estimate the cost of equity. So they're using the formula that you just saw. Since, start, since uh, common equity include both business and financial risk, the beta that we estimated also have both business and financial risk. However, um, so it is if everything remains the same. So if both the business risk and the financial risk remains this uh, remains unchanged, we can use the expected required return based on the capital asset pricing model as a discount rate. If a firm expect its financial risk to change, and this is quite often, for example, a, com a, a company may buy, may buy back stock. Uh, you may also uh, borrow money to buy back stock. So anytime a firm changes its leverage, um, we'll have to make some adjustments. Another situation where we may need to make adjustment is for companies that are not publicly traded. Remember, when we estimate beta, we need the return on the stock and return on the market. If a company is not publicly traded, then it doesn't have stock price um, or a readily available stock price. Once again, we, we can, uh, in, even in those cases, we can still compute the cost of equity and we can use um, the estimated beta of either a comparable firm in the same industry or we can use an industry-wide beta and then we have to adjust for different leverage. Professor DeModeran um, is a professor at uh, New York University. Uh, he has computed beta by sectors. Let's go take a look. So different sectors means different industry. And here are the betas. Uh, so we can take a quick look. So for example, uh, automobile industry, you expect that to be relatively risky. So auto parts and automobile industry um, versus cable TV that is lower risk because 
is uh, people watch TV, whether or not times are good or whether or not times are bad. Um, so you, in general, you will likely see um, there is a difference in different kind of um, industry. So another example here, hotel has a beta of 1.79. Obviously, when times are bad, people travel a lot less. These are discretionary spending. Um, whereas household products, um, that's much lower risk, so you have a uh, lower beta. So once again, remember beta include both business risk as well as financial risk. So it, it does take into account the debt to equity ratio. So DE is debt to equity ratio. Um, so that may explain uh, some of the variations from industry uh, to industry. And here is a graph that shows the relationship between systematic risk and return or the cost. So if you have no risk, so risk-free, the cost of equity will be the risk-free rate. If the systematic risk is one, which is the same as the market, the cost of capital the cost of equity will be the same as the market return. Uh, so the higher the risk, the higher the cost of equity, the lower the risk, the lower the cost of equity. And remember that we were when we talk about um, the cost of equity and systematic risk, it has both the financial risk component and the business risk component. And what we, uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, ways that we can adjust the equity risk, equity beta for different financial risk, different capital structure. See you here soon.